So welcome everyone to the first in the Transforming Assessment webinar series for 2013. Welcome back for those of you who are our regular uh, participants here and welcome to all our new participants who perhaps haven't participated in one of these sessions before. Tonight or today, wherever you are in the world, we're very fortunate to have Muriel Filamé, uh, who's a senior researcher at the Henri Tudor Research Centre at Luxembourg. And Muriel has uh, published quite a bit around metadata and the use of metadata in digital resources. But tonight, well, well today, what we're going to hear about is the semi-automatic generation of assessment items, the objectives, challenges and perspectives. So Muriel, I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, hi everybody. So um, I'm very pleased to be with you. So um, I'm going to try to talk about the semi-automatic generation of assessment items today. Uh, first of all, I'm going to um, introduce a little bit uh, myself and the group I work in. So um, this is a public research center in the Chinese country of Luxembourg. Uh, we're in a group uh, specialized in knowledge technologies. Uh, we do research and innovation, so basically a lot of um, uh, collaboration with uh, real world people, um, industries and um, public services and so on. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary team including psychologists, psychometricians, uh, software engineers and so on. Um, we work on several application domains but we have developed for several years now a group which is working on e-assessment. Um, we have multiple collaborations with ETS in the US, DIPS in, the U, um, in Germany, uh, Karolinska Institute in Sweden and many others. Um, what uh, we've been doing, so we're doing two kind of things. One is more operational. Um, this is like the, the TAL platform, which is an open source um, system for the delivery of e-assessment. Um, it is based on semantic technologies and we've been developing it for several years now. Um, it is used for it has been used uh, in a number of diff, in a number of um, uh, assessment types including uh, diagnostic assessment formative assessment but also large scale assessment and it is it's currently supports the OECD PISA and PX studies uh, which I'm certain you're familiar with um, so uh, on the research side, however, uh, related to e-assessment, we do assessment item generation, complex item design, as well as the use of tangible user interfaces uh, in assessment, in particular to measure 21st century skills such as collaborative skills. So I do come from the metadata and semantic field and uh, I'll, um, I'll try to keep the talk a little, um, uh, to stick a little bit to that kind of uh, activities which uh, are reusing semantics in the field of e-assessment. Um, the objective um, of this talk is basically to provide an overview of semi-automatic assessment generation um, for both formal and informal learning and present some of the work we have been carrying out here on assessment item generation from the semantic web, uh, from models and the specific issue of the generation distractors uh, from semantic data sources. Um, so um, this is an outline of the talk um, which I added so that you don't get too much lost. So the first section is really on uh, trying to give an overview, um, then uh, provide um, an insight on some of the work we've been doing and the generation of assessment items from the web, the generation of distractors uh, for match and choice questions. Um, so why generating items? This is generally to provide a context. I um, borrowed those numbers to um, uh, the work done by uh, Mr. Gill in, um, in Canada. Um, it was estimated that the cost of items was between $1,500 and $2,000 per item. And for um, a large item bank to support adaptive testing, for instance, you would need an investment of something like 3 to $4 million. Uh, just for the item creation. Um, this is also, there is also a security issue uh, in trying to um, create multiple items from the same uh, template uh, 
um, which is to include variability in items. So um, typically to avoid brain dump, uh, so having people try to remember a particular item and um, copy it somewhere so that other people can, um, can copy it and use it for the next round. Um, the idea is in this case to include some kind of variability so that it's not that straightforward to uh, remember a copy um, an item. Um, it is also important in other um, other contexts. One is actually in formal learning environments. Um, scalability. If you find the, the numbers I gave too high, I'm giving the reference for it. And the, this reference is actually um, it's it's actually for. Um, uh, referring to uh, specific studies. I agree it's not only for multiple choice items. Um, so following, um, so there are other types of domains in which it's actually important in formal learning environments uh, where it's impossible that professionals create test items for all types of self-assessment. Um, then the personalization of learning paths of uh, personalization and formative assessment uh, or on-demand assessment in which it's, you also have a clear scalability issue. Um, so this is an illustration of large item banks to show that indeed you have a variety of items and um, the issue of assessment item generation is very different according to the type of items we're talking about. Um, we have been developing very complex items, uh, but uh, it is true that a lot of the work on item generation is currently done on fairly simple items. Um, this is an illustration just of um, a newspaper article which was referring to a study that has been done to try to demonstrate the value of um, passing tests uh, for formative purposes, so how much you learn from a test. Uh, just as an illustration of a growing interest of formative assessment rather than only summative and so on. Um, then learners create items for formative assessment. Um, this is the case, for instance, in certain types of flashcards uh, where people will include, for instance, multiple choice items or these kind of things, and where you have the development of um, community sites to exchange flashcards or that kind of things. Um, many applications are developed for to let anyone develop their own quizzes and um, other types of simple assessment items. Um, the development of social learning sites, I was taking the example of Buzu, which is a community uh, website for language learning where you have um, learners who, um, who can actually correct um, the, um, a text written in a language they know, uh, but um, written by another learner. So for instance, if I learn German, um, but I'm French speaker, native, a native French speaker, which is my case, um, then I can correct the text written by someone else in French and have a German speaker correct mine. So you've got like a, a, a different role of learners in the overall assessment process in this, um, in this um, context. Um, this is an, an example of a system we've been uh, working on uh, with um, the Antonin University in Lebanon um, to try to generate items from um, text uh, to try to represent a way for people to um, transform the browsing experience into a learning experience through the creation of um, through, uh, them identifying specific um, things they would like to remember and use that for creating items automatically. So these are a number of illustrations of different contexts in which you might be willing to have uh, implement an assessment item generation mechanism. So what is assessment item generation? Um, um, this is a, an idea, um, a representation of the process. So what you have is um, potentially a task model for start, then a template, then data source or a mechanism to actually create variables, and I'm, I'm going to get back to that concept of variables. Then optionally a cognitive model for uh, understanding how people will solve the item, um, and a mental model 
to represent how a, pers a particular person is expected to solve a particular item. Um, the, um, here I, I present the um, three steps um, that are distinguished by um, Gill again, uh, the definition of variables in assessment tasks, the generation of items based on those variables, and statistical models used to estimate the psychometric properties of each item. And that's really a big, big challenge to uh, be able to generate items, but also to um, be able to predict the kind of uh, psychometric properties you can attach to it. So here I illustrated the three steps. Um, I'm going to go a little um, deeper in what that represents. Uh, I borrowed that item and it has a number of different parts which can be transformed into variables, so um, on which it is possible to include variations. Um, so Typically in, in the STEM, you have the approximate location of essence, um, and you can transform that specific bit, like items, um, like essence, into a variable. So that for the next one, instead of asking the pro approximate location of essence, you might ask the approximate location of Argentina, of, um, of Buenos Aires, sorry. Um, then you have the key, which is the correct answer, the options, uh, which are going to vary according to the item, and the auxiliary information, in this case, a map. Um, the thing is that it really depends which kind of constructs you're trying to measure. So if you're asking the approximate location of Argentina and changing the options, um, are you actually willing to measure um, the fact that the person knows about the location of Argentina and then the auxiliary information just has an illustration value? Um, or are you trying to know whether the person is actually able to read a map? In the first case, the psychometric properties um, are expected to change significantly. It's, it might be very different for a particular population uh, to know about um, the location of, our, of um, Buenos Aires or to know about the location of Athens. However, if it's only about reading a map and you have the same kind of map, it is not expected that the psychometric properties will change significantly. Um, the role of variables, so this is about to represent the fact that um, in some cases uh, for the same kind of item you can include variability but with different, um, um, to actually, according to what you're going to change in the item, uh, you might be willing also to measure different constraints and then have different psychometric um, indicators. The existing strategies for the creation of variables um, are basically algorithms, so typically if you have a mathematics item, uh, it's pretty straightforward to understand this, um, that you're going to have a variable with a range uh, between 3 and 18. Um, you can have also natural language processing, so this is typically the case of vocabulary questions or closed questions, uh, which can be generated from the text. Uh, structured data, data sets, that's also the case for vocabulary questions, so taking into consideration a lexical uh, resource such as a diction dictionary or something like the WordNet data set, um, or a domain model. Um, I'm going to get back to that concept of domain model, but the idea is to represent the different entities um, that um, are present in a particular problem or issue and the kind of relations they have between each other. And that domain model can be either extracted from natural language or created um, by um, experts. So, so far um, the automatic generation of our items is kind of a little bit easier for mathematics and scientific subjects where you can have um, um, mathematic variables because it's quite easy to modify 3 to 4 to 10 to 50. Um, or in L2, so um, language learning um, applications. Um, there is, however, a big challenge to generate all the types of variables, uh, such as the additional information, so the multimedia part of an item, uh, the historical knowledge, providing feedback, for instance, and including variations in, um, in this part. 
So the sources for the generation of items are basically texts and models. Um, so extracting questions from text, here I took two examples, uh, but the idea is to you take a text, a text and you try to generate a closed question, for instance, by removing uh, one, um, one word or one element from that text and try to find either in the same text or in a different lexical resource um, um, a set of uh, credible alternatives. Uh, you can also transform a sentence from full text into a question, uh, such as which disease or syndrome may progress to viruses, um, and then try to find the, uh, to identify the correct answer in the text. So to do that, there are uh, what we call uh, discourse connectives. So um, basically it means you will identify in a text uh, things like because, um, since, when, although, and take that, um, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I was, I was looking at the chat, um, and take that into consideration uh, to actually extract a number of, um, um, a number of sentences and transform them into questions, uh, such as uh, because means it's causal, and then you can create a question starting with why, um, things like that. So this is basically, I'm not going to go into any detail, but this is the kind of um, um, mechanism that's entailed. Um, then extracting questions from models. Um, so this is a model I extracted uh, from the work done in a, uh, a European project called Di DynaLearn. Uh, so you had a number of experts going, um, getting together and trying to model a particular problem. So you have the definition of entities, such as human population, natural resource, ecosystem, and then the relations between those entities like require, so human population requires natural resources. Uh, things like that. So the idea is to model a number of problems and then to extract uh, the um, the relation, the yeah, the relations and a number of information from it, and to generate items from that. So the assumption is that it is interesting because it can allow the adaptation of the learning um, of, of the um, assessment items generated and the um, learning paths, basically, informative assessment uh, along the current context or person. Um, it's independent from particular representations or the learning resources. It means that from the same model you can actually extract different types of items. Um, it can be a multiple choice question, a simple choice question, an open question uh, in certain cases. Um, the constraint is that the a domain model must exist, of course, and that requires bringing together experts to design a model of what learners should learn. And this is um, kind of tricky because it's very expensive, uh, it requires the experts to be available and so on. It requires also for certain types of knowledge that um, it changes over time. So if we know something new, then it needs to be added. Um, so we've tried to work at several level, um, so the semantic models first, uh, the assessment item generation, and then the test delivery platform. I'm not going to get into the detail of that, uh, just present a little bit uh, the work we've done on the assessment item generation. But first of all, um, so we focused mostly on um, the model, uh, the generation of items from models, um, and we, we were wondering something about the semantic web. Is it possible to uh, generate questions from the semantic web? So I'm going to give a very short introduction of what this is about. Um, really crash course on um, RDF and semantic technologies. So um, at the top uh, uh, at the top part of uh, the slide you can see um, Einstein, Ulm, uh, so Einstein was born in a, uh, in a city called Ulm, so what you can do is with your model and in RDF say uh, there's an entity called Einstein uh, which has a relation that has birthplace with um, another entity called Ulm. What you can even do is define, and at the bottom of my slide, 
um, define that Einstein, the entity Einstein, is actually a scientist, has a type scientist. And Ulm has a type city, and city is actually a type of location. So this is the kind of um, things you can do with modeling um, knowledge with semantic technologies. I'm not going to go into details, but that means if you only define that Einstein has various place Ulm, you can also know things like uh, uh, Ulm is actually a city, it's actually a location, and, it, and you might even know that it's uh, actually in Germany. So um, on the semantic web, one really interesting use of product, well, not exactly, but yeah. Um, what you can do is um, uh, create linkages, because this is kind of what the web does. It creates links between different types of resources. So this is exactly the same thing with Semantic Web. Um, me, uh, providing on my uh, website information like Einstein, the way I understand Einstein, so my Einstein, uh, has as birthplace um, Ulm. Uh, and instead of defining my Ulm, I can define uh, that this is the Ulm defined by someone else, like DBpedia. Um, and in this case, um, that's really interesting because I can then, just by stating this, I can then allow a machine to know that Einstein has a birthplace, something called Ulm, but since DBpedia has a lot of additional information about Ulm, then it means that I can derive that Einstein has a birthplace um, in Ulm, that Ulm is in Germany, that um, it is a university um, city, and that kind of thing. So there are a lot of other information I can get from just that statement. An alternative is actually to create my Einstein has a birthplace, my Ulm, and that and, and then defining that my Ulm is the same as the Ulm defined by Dubipedia, and it's going to go the same way, um, meaning I can then know the same, the same kind of things that Ulm is in Germany and that kind of things. So this is just a, a very short introduction of what the semantic web looks like. So in real world, um, here you all recognize um, Wikipedia. Uh, which if you're a teacher, you know your students like very much. Um, and uh, it's on the right-hand corner, you can see that uh, Albert Einstein is defined as, um, so there are some structured information that states where uh, Einstein was born, where he died, when he was born, when he died, and that kind of thing. Behind that, so if you go to the source of that page, you can actually get a link to what is called DBpedia. So there are people who are actually playing around with Wikipedia pages and get the structured information from it, extract it, and make it available as an open data set. So this is what you can see here. Um, the, um, um, the URI is in here. If you're interested, you can just have a look. Um, and it provides a structured um, representation of all the information they can get from this with all the links. So in this case, I can know that the academic advisor um, of Einstein was Mr. Heinrich Friedrich Weber, um, and I can find his birthplace in Ulm and that kind of thing. Um, for machines, this is actually encoded in the way you can see here. And the academic advisor, Mr. Weber, uh, has a a unique name, uh, which is a URL, and by clicking that URL, I can get all the information about Mr. Weber. So that means um, I can use all those links to go inside DBpedia, but also outside DBpedia, and there are a, a lot of um, resources which are available in this way on the web. This is a representation of the different types of data sets and their uh, linkages, so the way in which they send to resources, they refer to the resources defined by other data sets. Um, and then that means um, why wouldn't we be able to use some of that knowledge? So DBpedia is kind of the um, Wikipedia level. So from a technical perspective, it's useful because it's uh, well organized and so on. But there are lots of data sets here created by scientists, created by cultural heritage institutions, um, created by a lot of people who do have uh, more, um, how, how to say that, 
um, uh, like on which the accuracy of information will be less debated. Let's put it that way. Um, but I'm talking in a more general manner here. Uh, the limitation of the model-based approach is that experts are difficult to mobilize for a long modeling exercise. So is, would it be possible to actually reuse existing data sources, which might not have been created for uh, the purpose of creating uh, an educational domain model, but we could actually reuse the data and made available for that. Uh, what about specialized professional knowledge? It changes all the time. Well, actually, there are people who are coding things all the time. And um, the type of knowledge you can find on the semantic web includes a lot of knowledge which uh, is not well codified in curricula right now. Um, but maybe we could reuse some of this. So we did a small um, experimentation on this was the idea of can we reuse linked open data as knowledge model for learning? First of all, is it feasible? Then are the data sets relevant and how much quality control do we need after that? This is for accuracy as well as data formatting and that kind of thing. So we created very simple items like factual knowledge for choice items, um, the kind of straightforward mechanism. This is uh, pretty much the architecture. So we had an item uh, template, um, and we created a QTI uh, representation of items. So this is the way it works. We use several data sources, um, so GBpedia, Cindy's Open Link, which are um, aggregators, so like semantic search engines, basically. Uh, and we made also a test with a local model, so an educational model we created with an expert um, in the, from the dentistry department of Karenska Institute in Sweden. Um, and we tried to generate items from this. Um, the, QT, the item templates were QTI items, so I, I assume you all know about QTI. This is uh, standard by AMS uh, for the representation of test items. Um, and we created them as uh, JSON templates, meaning, as you can see, all the variables are uh, represented with curly brackets. Um, get knowledge from the lot. So the first thing was to uh, collect information from the semantic web. So this is the way you do it, to spark your query. I'm not going to get into the technical details. Uh, the first um, the first try we did was, was the random selection of distractors among siblings. So what are siblings or just, um, a, in this case, uh, this is a, a country and then capital of that country. So uh, the idea was to take capitals of other countries. So basically, if you have the state of capital, then we, we, we could use you. Um, and this is the final uh, representation of a QTI XML item. Uh, so you have, um, it's just a standard item, basically. Um, and then we uh, delivered it with the Tau platform. So this is just an illustration. Once you've created the QTI item, you can easily include it in, um, in Tau, as well as in Moodle or um, other uh, QTI compliant platforms. Uh, this is a test, so the, the, this is an example of the test with DVpedia. This was um, a question on uh, who succeeded to um, whoever king as ruler of France. Uh, we used an ontology and so on, it doesn't matter. The kind of problem we found uh, was inaccuracy, not very much, but some inaccuracies. So in this case, there was a mix up that the three musketeers, uh, who are actually fictional characters of a um, uh, novel, but the fictional characters were at the same time as a famous king, but it's not, it's just not a king, right? Um, most interestingly, um, the issue was with the labels. <coughs> I'm sorry. So um, in some cases, kings do have different labels. They have a nickname. They have a, um, a Roman number. Sometimes they do, they do have um, uh, an Arabic number associated with them. So you have a certain inconsistency in the way in which the naming of the kings was represented. And we didn't have a straightforward way of sorting that out. It is possible um, to do some kind of a linguistic um, processing. Uh, but it, it was just kind of the, our original objective was really to identify the kind of data quality issues we would uh, find. 
So this is an example of an item with um, the, uh, where um, three things were generated as options uh, with a different pattern, uh, linguistic pattern, um, syntactic pattern, sorry. Um, then this is the, the list of the data related issues we found and then we tried to derive the chance that an item would um, end up being defective. Uh, we get even with no processing at all and uh, the use of the lowest level of modeling, more than 50% of the items which were directly usable, that's not great because it was very simple kind of items, but at the same time as soon as we put a little bit of um, additional intelligence as a system, it rose significantly. So uh, this is kind of encouraging. Um, but we actually ended up wondering, yes, okay, this is fine, we can, we can generate nice questions, but um, well, to actually make that a proper educational resource, we need to get a little bit into what is an educational domain model. So um, is that data actually representative of a domain model, so um, representation of knowledge which is good for education? Um, so what does that mean? Um, here I'm getting back to the DynaLearn um, uh, models. These are two types of models uh, that were represented. Uh, the taxonomy, so that's pretty straightforward. You've got a hierarchical structure of uh, things. Then um, a different one which is representing actually factors and the influence, uh, negative or positive influence of different factors on uh, different entities. Um, the kind of modeling uh, mechanism that were used uh, go from uh, quantity spaces, so pretty much ranges. Uh, a population goes between, uh, is a numeric value between zero and whatever. Um, the factors, as I was saying, positive and, neg and negative causal relations, conditional statements, and representation of evolution. So in terms of modeling, uh, this represents certain types of challenges. But the, the interesting thing is, would it be possible to actually determine which kind of modeling mechanism can be used and define standard patterns which would be good for education? Um, so in our particular case, um, the specific things we were really missing were what the, associating the kind of knowledge, even very factual and so on, to a particular curricula or at least a level of expertise. Um, so that would be the boundaries of the model, which part of the model is actually relevant for a particular educational context, um, uh, both the width and depth, because you might be willing to uh, take only several concepts uh, and not getting into the detail of all the relations they have between each other. Um, the definition of an audience then, um, the mechanism to define a learning path, so going from one part of the model to the other. Uh, mechanism, specific mechanisms to use the model, uh, for instance, for the generation of distractors. And then the definition of useful types of properties for particular learning and assessment purposes. That can be causal properties or process related properties, for instance. Um, this is um, an attempt that was uh, done by um, a couple of researchers to try to map uh, specific types of um, model structures uh, to particular types of knowledge that could be uh, tested. So they were representing this in the knowledge dimension of the taxonomy of Bloom. Um, with things like a meronymy would be uh, factual knowledge, so uh, something is part of something else. Um, causal uh, and effect relations would be in conceptual knowledge and this kind of things. That would require actually, as I was saying before, standardizing a little bit the way in which models are created. And this is a mechanism then to define specific types of questions and the natural language that goes with those questions. Um, we've done a little test, I'm just going to mention it quickly, to actually see whether with um, the study, so we, we've done the study, I'm going to get back to this. Uh, with the study we had, uh, um, we, we were doing with um, uh, testing just general knowledge of capitals of the world, uh, we could actually uh, do some web mining and guess for particular populations whether it would be possible to predict that most people would actually know one rather than the other. 
And we find a pretty good correlation, but not directly on the answer, rather um, uh, rather on the um, on the country itself. Uh, this is very early kind of hypothesis we were making, but it was kind of interesting to see that there was a, a fairly good correlation um, between both. This is very on factual knowledge. I know about the, the limitation of, say, of this, um, but we found that pretty interesting um, as a way of potential enrichment of an educational, of a, of a model to make it educational. Now, how to increase the quality of items, and that relates to the definition of specific processes to actually uh, make a model usable. Um, I'm sure you wouldn't have failed this test. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mention a little bit the questions afterward. I, I think they do appear. Uh, what is a good distractor first? Um, how the selection of distractors. So we've, we've uh, generated choice and match items. Um, the match items are a little uh, trickier, uh, but um, I'm not going to get too much into detail because that's not um, the, the real topic here. Uh, so what is a good distractor? A concept semantically close to the key, which however cannot serve as the right answer itself, I found that definition is pretty okay. Um, so for a choice item, it would be, it should not be overlapping because otherwise um, it would create confusion, but sufficiently close to the correct answer to decrease the odds that the test takers will find them by chance, right? So your current approach is to the generation of distractors. Uh, first of all, you have to distinguish between full text and semantic models. So in full text, this is about the linguistic analysis. So for instance, you find um, a word or a concept, and then you try to find the same text, uh, a credible alternative to it based on occurrences, on uh, potentially external sources uh, like dictionaries or lexical uh, resources like WordNet. Um, from semantic models, it's a little different. So uh, what you usually do is try to find siblings. That's the original thing we did. So you find other capitals or other kings of France or, you know. Um, the, or uh, you use a semantic structure to generate distractors in a, a little bit um, more elaborate way. So other types of relations, not just siblings, but uh, cousins or whoever. Uh, but there's usually no measure or attention to item quality. That's the big problem, right? And that's, that's a tricky one, and that's what makes, makes an item really usable, right? So um, another possibility is to use external concepts from a variety of uh, additional resources. So um, what we did was uh, use different types of similarity metrics, uh, taxonomy similarity, relation similarity, attribute similarity. If you're interested, um, there is a, a reference to the work we've done on that um, at the end of this paper, of this um, uh, presentation, but I'm not going to get into the details of this. But this is just to um, give an idea that we were using the different types of relations between concepts. Uh, so what you can see in the right-hand corner is are the representation of a graph, so this, the model is basically represented as a graph, and you're going to take advantage of different types of relations. Now, we're getting to a first question. Uh, similarity has been measured in many ways uh, in an automatically, but it's usually, it's the efficiency of any similarity metric is actually usually measured according to a particular application, like recommender systems, or um, in our case, assessment. So the first thing we did was actually to try to identify how much our metrics were correlated with the perception of similarity uh, that people had. So this was done in a different uh, field, uh, which was movies, but we asked a sample of people, um, do you think those films are similar or not similar? Uh, or how much similar do you think those movies are? And then we tried to find whether that was well correlated with what we could find in different similarity metrics. So once we had, we were fairly confident that our metrics were performing uh, better than other metrics, then we could apply it, apply it to uh, the experimentation of the creation of distractors. Um, 
So calculating the semantic similarity between the structures and the correct answer. So in this case, the question is, what is the, the capital of Gabon? So um, you all know the, the answer, right? It's written just uh, right here, Libreville. So um, on the left-hand side, uh, you see the um, options that were created uh, from the random selection of siblings. And then on the right-hand side, the um, uh, distractors created from the semantic similar using the semantic similarity metrics. So in the first case, you've got two Asian capitals and one African one, the the Gabon. In the second case, all three are from African countries. So they are theoretically more um, that they, sh they are supposed to make the items more difficult. Well, let's see what the result was. So we had, uh, we tested um, the two um, series of items with um, uh, two groups. Uh, the first series was using the, was not using semantic similarity, the, first, the second one was. And as you can see, so the red, um, uh, the red columns represent the ones where the semantic similarity was used. And you can see that uh, the percentage of correct answers uh, significantly decreased, and we validated that with um, IRT um, to ensure that um, the test was valid. Um, so as I was saying, the problem is, so we, we, we kind of demonstrated we could increase the, similar, the, the difficulty of items, but can we actually measure it or predict it in some way? The first question is, um, what is, what would be the good structure of an item? Uh, so taking the overall item. So, uh, at the bottom, I tried to represent, I'm not sure that's all that clear, but, um, the uh, blue one, the blue bubble is the uh, correct answer, and the red ones are the distractors. So where should the distractors be? Because I tried to review existing guidelines, and they kind of say, well, it should be similar, but then how similar? Should, should the distractors also be similar to each other? Should they be very close to the correct answer? Where, where should the um, distance be? And that's not really relevant if you're talking about manual creation of items, but if you're talking about the automatic generation of items, then we have numbers uh, behind the semantic similarity. So we can actually calculate um, the, what we call the dispersity of an item, which is how close or how remote uh, the uh, different options are to each other, and but we don't have a clear answer on whether it's actually good that two distractors are close to each other, um, just as close to each other as they are to the uh, correct answer or not. And I took the example of who is the author of Oliver Twist. Um, in this case, you've got two distractors which are very close to each other, but uh, they all also um, uh, they are also writers, uh, novel writers, just like Charles Dickens, but of course they are not from the same century. Um, so what, what would, be, would it be better to have um, two authors from the 19th century? How, how does that play, really? And uh, I, I didn't really find uh, a good answer to that, so if you have any insight, I'd be very happy to hear it. Um, so uh, this comes the conclusion. Um, yes, we, we are, uh, Matthew, be good and try to reverse analysis on human-made question. We've actually done that, so um, this is kind of the work we are currently doing. We've asked uh, someone who's creating tests to actually create uh, distractors for the same questions uh, that we have created distractors, and we're in the process, with, so we don't have definitive results right now, but to try to measure how distant from uh, the semantic similarity metric his uh, suggestions were, uh, and whether they were more distant than ours. The way in which it's currently made, there is no real rule. So, um, uh, as far as I could see, uh, on the um, on the similarity, uh, whether one sh um, whether distractors should be as close to each other as they are to the correct answer. However, since we don't have metrics, the, what we're doing now is trying to take humanly created ones and try to add metrics to it, try to understand the mechanism. So as a conclusion, because I'm late, 
Um, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, we started a little late, but anyway. Um, so just to make uh, people answer just as a message, uh, different types of assessment item generation. From model or from text, it's quite different, or it can be quite different. Uh, the relation with the skill or knowledge to be assessed or with the construct. Uh, the existence of a cognitive model and um, the predictability of psychometric indicators according to the, the level to which we know uh, a particular task and the factors which influence uh, difficulty in particular. Um, the domain-dependent processes, the structured generation typically is domain-dependent. Um, and the informative assessment versus summative and diagnostic, which do not uh, create the same constraints on the predictability of uh, psychometric indicators, for instance. Uh, and I'll finish with a slide where I'm taking an exa um, a word that um, Gil, again, uh, is using in emerging science. I'm giving um, uh, a reference to a book he just released. I didn't have time to read it, but um, on automatic item generation, which is uh, which looks pretty interesting. Um, but I um, so it's called, it, it says uh, basically that assessment item generation uh, is aimed at uh, moving the, um, the assessment item creation from an art to an emerging science. So basically from, some, from an activity where know-how is very important, experience is very important, human experience, to something where it actually can be computed somehow. Um, there are still a number of issues. The quality process that depends on data sources, as we illustrated with the semantic web example, the prediction of psychometric indicators, the creation of more complex items, including multimedia resources, for instance, that's not really tackled so far. Um, and um, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the assessment of higher level skills beyond knowledge level. So I illustrated factual knowledge. This is very basic. But I also uh, showed that there are models existing for other types of knowledge. But what about higher level skills and how does it impact predictability, for instance? Um, and then supporting the model creation, the kind of examples I was showing, which were based on models, the existence of models, that requires also accompanying the, uh, um, the process of creating models, educational models, uh, and or trying to uh, um, make existing models um, educational models, so models which have an educational value, which are good for generating learning resources. Um, and as a real final word, this is really a semi-automatic process, so um, for the most part, it's very, it's still difficult to guarantee that um, no human edits is going to be necessary. I think that's it. Um, well, you can see afterwards, so I acknowledge um, uh, the contribution to um, a number of works I've presented by other people beyond me. Uh, some of our references here, uh, if you need any other, because I might have forgotten some, um, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, you have my email in the presentation. And other ref um, relevant references I've used here. Um, and this is for Jeff. Uh, thanks very much, Muriel. That was a fascinating and informative um, presentation, and I think everyone would have really enjoyed that. Uh, Matthew, did you? Ah, yes, you're going to put in the survey link. Yep, thanks very much. So that's gone up, everyone. Now, uh, what we'd like you to do, everyone, first of all, is to fill in the uh, feedback form, if you could, before you head off. Uh, but the other thing is, please um, ask any questions you want now or make any comments. Uh, so you can do that by putting up your hand. If you wish, remember we've got the little hand symbol there, which if you want to ask a question, you can do that, and we know what order you can uh, to ask people to respond in. The other, of course, is you can just type into the chat uh, as well, uh, if you've got a difficulty with your mic as well. So now it's over to the audience. Uh, Muriel, as people type in uh, questions there, I was wondering whether you wanted to uh, read those and respond to them. Um, yeah, I can probably do that. I was trying to catch, uh, there have been a, a number of things discussed, so um, 
the choice of distractors being the not, yes, of course, I fully agree. Um, it's just that you know how people are. They work on uh, computer science things and so on, and so they try to put everything in a machine. Like, um, it's not that I really believe it's uh, it's possible to do it only this way. Uh, and that's why I'm not arguing for doing things fully automatically. Uh, but I think in some cases it might be useful to have um, suggestions or this kind of things. And just try out until where you can go um, in order to um, collect as much information as possible. And one thing which I believe is really interesting in any case is trying to understand um, practices. So for instance, what we've done so far is to collect distractors from uh, uh, human creating distractors. But for, for the same questions that we were using, um, if we can do that with different people, then we can actually compare the different uh, practices. And that's also pretty interesting, I believe, as feedback to humans, even for human creating um, items. So there are a number of things here which I'm, I fully agree. I'm not trying to put humans into a machine, and I'm not saying everything can be automated. Um, but it's always interesting to see whether we can study the current practices and to what level we can go in terms of supporting uh, the automated mechanisms. Um, yeah, and yeah, this is this is really about filtering. Um, and I saw something about the um, is there something in the field of artificial intelligence? You can scroll back through the questions. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm doing. How far are we from the usage of such knowledge analysis in the field of artificial intelligence? Mm hmm. I'm not sure I understand that one. Um, if you create a question using a Wikipedia article, what is the effect of editing the article? Yeah. Um, so there has been um, an experiment with trying to generate um, questions from Wikipedia as a way of improving Wikipedia. And that's definitely an interesting task. Uh, so trying to correct it backwards. The problem with that is um, you need to choose what is your reference. Is your reference the content of the Wikipedia page or whatever, or is it the person? If um, you're taking the Wikipedia page as the reference, um, then you consider this is the truth. And then you test the person according to that truth. Does that person know about that truth? Uh, on the opposite, you can test um, the Wikipedia page and then you take the person as the expert and you test whether everything which is on the page is actually correct. Uh, but you consider that the expert has the truth. Now the problem is when you're not certain of either of those. And there are ways of doing, of doing this. Uh, so in this case what you do is for instance try to um, uh, elaborate a level of trust or expertise on the expert, on the learner, on the on the person you have. So, uh, for instance, if you have sufficient a sufficient number of questions uh, distributed to that specific person, and you know the answer for sure of, to a number of those questions, that person always answered correctly. So you might predict that the next one he's going to answer correctly. Another example, and that's really kind of things used in games for a purpose, for instance, is to build um, uh, mechanisms from the crowd. So I'm going to give an example, um, a, a system which is a, a game to actually create metadata on pictures. What you're doing is actually you're asking people to play a game and guess, uh, so people are presented with a picture, uh, guess what uh, another um, uh, another player will say, so the kind of keyword he will put about that picture. So if you have a, a picture of a horse, um, I may write a horse, or I may write uh, um, a sheep. But of course, 
uh, maybe out of 100 people, uh, there are very little people who are going to write cheap. If they want to write um, stupid things, one will write cheap, another one dog, and so on, and the majority will still have written horse. So by uh, building that kind of um, quantitative statistical uh, model for quality evaluation of the answers, you can actually uh, try to identify weird things, like when I was identifying the three musketeers as a king, probably at some point you can identify that nobody is actually choosing that distractor, and there might be a problem with that one. But there's no real good model to do this at the moment. Um, okay, I'm a little... It's, it's a little bit um, how much work has been done to evaluate user reaction to automatically uh, generated items. Have you got that far? Um, we have always filtered before. Um, we have always filtered before because we didn't think it was very useful to present people with items which are not good enough. Um, so uh, what I have done is to work with um, a psychometrician here um, who's um, also working um, as a, a professional item creator and um, she has um, she has defined uh, selection rules based on what we were creating so that's why I I can provide you with numbers of items which were good uh, without edits uh, but we only selected those. Um, then the reactions were, were okay. There was no problem related to this because they were selected. Uh, I mean, the, the item template was not generated. It was uh, manually created. And then when we validated the variables, it's, it's just like um, a human mechanism. But what we did is actually to organize a test so that we, we got the results from the test. So that is the kind of reactions we got. And the, the behavior of the test was good enough uh, so that it, it was a valid test and, um, and the, its, its value was good enough, so it was okay. Okay, uh, the, so um, you will find in, um, uh, so the first, uh, this statistical analysis, uh, we did the first one uh, with the DBPD examples, uh, which was really not trying to improve the mechanism. That was really the raw data. Uh, so you can find the numbers at least. I, I don't remember whether I gave them for all of them. I think I did. Uh, the samples are limited, but you can find it in, a, in an article which is at the end of the presentation, uh, um, which has Wikipedia in its title. Um, the uh, for the improvements, I do have that on my desk, but it's not yet published. But um, I would be happy to get back in touch with you as soon as we've formalized it. Uh, Muriel, just joking. Uh, Ben and uh, make a comment as well. Uh, one of the things I find really interesting uh, about the work you've been doing is it really makes us sit back and think about all our assessment items. You know, I know uh, in particular you've been taking particular types of questions, particular formats. Uh, often it's a very redu you know, reductionist approach, I guess, because of the algorithms and the sort of approach you have to take. But what I really think is interesting is it actually makes us sit back and think about all our assessment items and all our assessment questions and responses and how we actually uh, design all of our assessments. Yeah, I don't know how much insight you can get from um, from this work, from this type of work yet, uh, but definitely that's the um, 
that's the way in which uh, we're trying to work. At the moment, the idea of the item generation is to uh, implement, and so one of the objectives, so there is research-related objective and then uh, operational-related objective, but one of the operational-related objectives is really to try to see whether it would be possible to have a, a mechanism for semi-automatic uh, generation of items, so not only mathematics items, but other types of items um, plugged into uh, a system like Tao or any other. So it's not, it's not like um, a one specific platform, it's, it's more uh, general and try to see whether we can assist uh, people to facilitate the human work. And again, I'm not trying to say um, the full automatics uh, mechanism will work in many cases. The example I gave was the um, uh, plugin we put uh, on the web browser to be able to have items generated uh, automatically. In this case, you don't have human intervention, but that's only possible for very simple items. For other types of items, it's a little more complicated, and the idea is to have that included in existing uh, platforms uh, to help out with the item creation. Okay, any other questions from our audience? Okay, Tim, would you like to take the microphone? Uh, thank you, Muriel, for a very interesting talk. Um, I was, as I was listening, I was trying to think about when I might imagine this being used. Um, I work in the IT department at the Open University, and I thought the time it would be most useful is for when you want to generate a lot of practice questions. So. You, know, you you have a you maybe have a course and the students are expected to read a lot of stuff and you want to give them a way to practice that very easily and that's an area where you couldn't afford to have humans create all the questions so automatic generation is particularly useful and also um, uh, well, anyway, so um, thinking about that situation brought into my mind the thing you get where a parent is hold, helping their child revise for an exam, and the parent has the textbook but doesn't really understand the subject and is trying to ask questions just based on the te textbook that they don't understand. And that just seemed like what we're trying to get the computer to do, I suppose. Um, yes, the, um, I've, I've mentioned in this work um, several times uh, the work done at Alberta uh, by uh, Gill's team, which is very interesting, although um, a lot focused on item banks. So um, uh, more traditional item banks, and it's it's really. Um, the kind of um, uh, of work which needs to be the reference. Um, but what we've tried to investigate is a little more um, um, uh, informal mechanisms or mechanisms where you would have to generate things uh, which are a little uh, more, um, uh, I mean, you might have more inaccuracy and so on. Um, they have done some work also on um, the generation of items from textbooks, so that's um, one thing, and that requires linguistic uh, mechanisms. Uh, what we're trying to do is also to work with um, the web as a, uh, not the web, like the whole web, learning resources online and that kind of things. But I think it's definitely this. So uh, parents trying to help out with um, uh, revision. When I was referring to flashcards, this is also something students create for themselves, so you you just um, they are already creating assessment items for themselves and exchanging them. So this is actually really um, uh, in the scope of formative assessment. How can we use that kind of work um, and see whether it is possible to um, uh, to integrate it into more or less formal uh, assessment practices which are currently being developed. But yes, um, I fully agree. This, this is a, a pretty good use case. Okay, any other questions?
Okay, Muriel, I think we might thank you and uh, just say thank you very much for your time. And we really appreciate you uh, doing the webinar, presenting that. I think people found that absolutely fascinating. And as I said, uh, what we'll do is this will be archived. We'll make it available. Uh, so on the Transforming Assessment website, Matthew will put up the link uh, once we process this. And uh, then you can let any of your colleagues uh, know about this as well. So Muriel, we really appreciate your time and your presentation. Thank you very much, and it's, um, it was um, very interesting having the chat with you, and um, thank you very much for your attention. Bye. Okay, bye, Muriel. Uh, Matthew, we could probably stop the recording now. Recording stopped.